Good day, I'm John Sheridan. Technology was one thing that defined the US Civil War. It was the start of the use of the telegraph, the railway, the machine gun, rifled weapons, observation balloons, different shapes of bullets, repeating rifles, submarines and photography. And you'd think with all that technology and 150 years, by now we would have been better at it than we probably are. What I'm going to do today is talk to you in the context of the US Civil War about some lessons that I've learned about technology management. In January 1963, Fighting Joe Hooker was appointed to command the Army of the Potomac by Abraham Lincoln. Hooker was a West Point graduate. He fought in the Indian Wars, the Mexican Wars. He'd been a farmer. He was a drinker, a gambler, a womanizer. He paid his own way with borrowed money to get from the West Coast of the US to the East Coast so he could be involved in the war. He petitioned Lincoln for a commission in the Army initially and then rose to command the Army of the Potomac. He was renowned as being devoted to his men and always looking after them. And he was a disaster. He destabilised his boss beforehand. He was appointed in a letter, and this is a really interesting letter to read, a letter by Abraham Lincoln that you can find easily. If you type into your favourite search engine, now or later, Lincoln Hooker letter, and just make sure you get all the words or you'll get a surprise. Um, <laughs> You'll see what Lincoln does in what I think is one of the best examples of giving someone direction about what you need to do in terms of your job. But also a really great letter that talks about the fact that Lincoln was appointing Hooker not because of his actions, destabilising his former boss, but in spite of those actions. He recognised in Hooker a problem with ambition, which he said was healthy in a certain way, particularly among generals, but wasn't good if carried to the extreme. His closing words to Hooker in this letter were, beware of rashness, but with energy and sleepless vigilance, go forward and give us victories. The interesting thing, I think, in this literally a, a one-page letter was really strong direction about what to do. And if you can capture that direction in managing technology, I think that's a really useful thing. <coughs> On the other side, we had Robert E. Lee, the commanding general of the Army of Northern Virginia. Lee was essentially almost a saint and became that almost after the war. He was completely renowned by all his men. Despite a bit of a slow start, he was considered almost invincible. Indeed, there's discussion that suggests many people discuss the fact that if only things had gone slightly differently, Lee could have won the war. More on that later. Lee had a very interesting command style. He tended to give orders in the form almost of suggestions. He talked about what he wanted to happen. He'd give people a broad idea. But he wouldn't necessarily give detailed instructions. And that worked really well for some people. Um, Thomas Jackson, Stonewall Jackson, you may have heard, heard, heard of, got what Lee meant and was able to do really great things. But a lot of people didn't. And what I think we see, when I, and I read a lot of um, statements of requirements in technology, what I think we see is this challenge of getting it right. The balance between describing the outcome you want to people who can understand that and act on it versus providing incredible detail, sometimes to people who don't need that much detail. And the more detail you provide, the more ways you tell your staff how to do something, not what to do, the, less, the more power you take from them, the less responsibility you give them. And that isn't good for any management outcome. Heroes aren't enough. When um, in the, the, the Confederate States Army, they had some really great generals, and this is um, Stonewall Jackson. When he lost his arm at the Battle of Chancellorsville, uh, his left arm, it was reported to General Lee, his boss, and Lee said, well, Jackson's lost his left arm, but I have lost my right arm. And indeed, there have been people who think that that's true, that Jackson's loss could have lost the South in the Civil War. I don't subscribe to that, but it's interesting anyway. 
That, that army that Lee and Jackson led was full of really good soldiers. They fought against enormous odds, pantless, shoeless, foodless, and often weaponless, and still had tremendous victories for a very long period of time. But the South was on a hiding to nothing when they began. The North had 22 million people, the South had nine, and four million of those were slaves. There was industry in the North to the South, or well, the North had a ratio of eight to one industries over the South. The North made 97% of firearms before the war started, 96% of locomotives, 94% of the cloth made in, the, in America, 93% of the iron, and 90% of the shoes. They had twice the density of rail that the South had. The South, who essentially started the fight, didn't have enough resources to see it through. How many IT projects have you seen that begin without proper resourcing, consume the resourcing in the and perhaps the contingency without delivering the first parts of the product, and then come struggling for more? Oh. If you, yeah, exactly. If you're going to start something, make sure you've got enough resources. Now, this is General Ambrose Burnside, who was um, appointed to command the Army of the Potomac just before Hooker in December of 1962. Um, if you're perceptive, you will have noticed why we call them sideburns on the side of our faces, because of General Burnside. Um, that word grew out of um, him. That, sadly, was probably his most positive contribution to history. Um, <laughs> He was, when he was appointed by um, Lincoln to replace McClellan, he actually felt unqualified for the job and he, he actually thought about not taking it. But when essentially Lincoln told him that the alternative was Hooker, he said, no, I'd rather do that than him. Um, Burnside was a very interesting chap because what he actually, where he was involved despite some earlier things and, and became infamous was at the Battle of Fredericksburg. In the Battle of Fredericksburg, the Confederate, the Union Army had tried to outflank Lee's army and get to the capital and destroy it before Lee could get there. But there was a bit of slippage in this project. In order to get there, what um, Burnside had to do was cross the Rappahannock River at Fredericksburg. The pontoons that were needed to cross the river were lost in the supply chain and took too long to actually get there. And by the, by the time they got there, the Confederates had reinforced the entire position, overlooked the Union position, made it really difficult for them to, um, to, to be seen and to, to avoid being seen and to actually do the attack. And not surprisingly, there was an enormous slaughter. But Burnside knew the pontoon boats were late. He could see what was happening on the slopes in front of him. He could detect the build-up of the Union Army, and still he sent his soldiers across that river, um, and they got quite far, but across that river and up the other side and were destroyed. Why? Well, he had this idea in mind, and he was going to stick with the plan, whatever happened. I've seen a lot of IT projects like that too. You've got to change your mind when circumstances change. Some of you might have seen the, um, the um, movie Cold Mountain with Nicole Kidman and some other persons that I didn't pay much attention to. Um, <laughs> that was a battle just after the Battle of the Crater at the siege of, of Petersburg. Now, a new idea had grown up in the Union Army. There'd been in this big, long siege in what was probably the first instance of trench warfare that was there, later on picked up in World War I. And the lines had kept extending, but the Union couldn't get through. And there was one regiment, one unit, that had a lot of miners from Pennsylvania in it. And the boss of the unit decided what we'll do is we'll dig a big tunnel under the Confederate lines and fill it with a bazillion tonnes of gunpowder and blow it up. And that will blow a hole in the, in the um, Confederate lines and we'll be able to attack through and do it. That's, you know, that's an interesting point. Um, they, they had a, a, one of the first black regiments tasked to do it. But things started to go wrong. Firstly, someone decided at the last minute that we wouldn't let the black regiment do that because they might not do it properly. And we'll put another regiment in that didn't have enough planning. 
And that regiment's commander got drunk and stayed um, in the lines and set the troops out anyway. They let the explosion off, the mine off. There was an enormous earth-shattering explosion. An enormous crater was filled, what was uncreated. Um, and then the Union, the relatively untrained Union armies, charged into the crater to discover that the other side was very steep and they couldn't climb out. And the, and the Confederate soldiers then just lined up on the top and shot down into them, massacring, massacring, mass, massacring hundreds, thousands of them as a consequence of this mistake. Now, the idea was actually sensible to start with, but they hadn't thought past the delivery. They hadn't thought about what would happen after it was in place. That's not really surprising either. How many projects have you seen that don't have the appropriate maintenance put in place, the OPEX that you, that you need after delivery, all those help desk arrangements and things like that. You've got to think more than the big bang. In July 1963, just before Independence Day, Lee engaged in a battle at Gettysburg. Um, he invaded the North in the Pennsylvania and his, his idea was to destroy the Army of the Potomac and then go on to Washington and hopefully win the war. Remember that the, one of the problems of the South, as well as all those imbalances I spoke about before, was they had to keep the Union out of the South. The, the, the Union could go on for a long time, so they thought they'd do this big thing. Now, on the first day, um, the, the Confederate forces came down from the North, um, ironically, um, came down from the north and got involved in a battle that they didn't really expect. But orders weren't followed completely and people got more engaged than they thought they would. But they forced the Union back onto a big, long ridge line, a big curving ridge line. Well positioned. The set, and this is, remember, this is the Confederate forces that have won almost all their battles previously or very, very severely knocked the Union forces around. The second day, Lee tries to attack the ridge again. He put some troops around to his right, and you might have heard of um, the Devil's Den and Little Round Top. It's stuck there, can't proceed. He has a demonstration attack going round on his left that gets involved, caught and bogged down, and those troops can't move. He knows, though, that he's won all the other battles. He's just come from a big victory at Chancellorsville. He knows that he's won all these battles previously. He has got really good soldiers. So the next day they decide that they'll advance over a mile and a half of open ground, uphill, into the Union guns, with the view of beating this Union army and taking over the battlefield and destroying them. I've walked that um, charge. It's a horrendous thought when you, when you even think about it. But they got to the top, about 20 guys, got to the high water mark of the Confederacy. What there was, though, was then a complete failure. They were destroyed, shot up, retreated. The army, the army of Northern Virginia was almost completely destroyed as a consequence of that battle. What happened? This bias for optimism. People thinking, it'll be all right. We've done this before. We don't need to plan. We can ignore the information that says things might go wrong because we're good at this. We can keep being good at it. A bias for optimism. I see that in project delivery all the time, a bias for optimism. People identify all the things that could go wrong and then decide they won't. Or they decide they won't be affected by it. Or that if they are affected, it won't be as bad as it seems. Getting rid of that bias for optimism is a real problem. In my project managers, I like to see a bias for pessimism because that means we'll promise low and deliver high. No relation, General Philip Sheridan. In the Battle of Cedar Creek on the 19th of October 1964, he was 20 miles away in Washington talking to administrative people about administrative matters. How often does that happen to you? There was a surprise attack by General Dougal Early on, of the Confederate forces on the Union lines. Caught them by surprise. Routed them. The, the Union soldiers were fleeing back to Washington. But those poor Confederate soldiers who hadn't eaten and didn't have shoes and didn't have pants, when they got to the Union camp, their discipline broke down. They, allowed, they um, went through the camp uh, looking, looting, looking for anything they could get, getting something to eat, and they became completely disorganised. 
Sheridan came, heard the guns, rides back from Washington, and along the way, gathers up the retreating soldiers, turns them around personally, turns them around, reforms them, drives them on. Not only does he defeat this army in this counterattack, he pushes them out of the Shenandoah Valley, which is forever after, had been the sort of brain basket of the Confederacy, pushes them out of there, and is for, forever after not a problem for the, for, the, for the Union. What's the lesson here? Sometimes you've got to be personally involved in a project in order to make it work. People need leadership to get things done. They need to see that someone's in charge. They need a plan and they need to follow them in order to get things to work properly. This is General George McClellan. He was second in his class at West Point. He was a, I mentioned him already, he was loved by his troops. He was a great trainer of troops and a great organiser. Lincoln said of him, if he can't fight himself, he excels in making others ready to fight. But, Lee, but McClellan's problem, or had two problems. One, he was tremendously cautious. He overestimated the size of the enemy forces by a sort of factor of two. So he always thought there were more, twice as many enemies there really were, and that he was going to get um, caught as a consequence. He held large amounts of his forces out of the work, out of, out of the battle, not, not involving them in what was going on, and lost battles as a consequence when he had lots of soldiers who hadn't been involved at all and could have changed the day. He was also incredibly derisive of, of Lincoln. He hated Lincoln, eventually running against him in the, 1960, the 1864, 1964 would have been good, the 1864 presidential campaign and a losing, of course. He was insubordinate, self-important. He rejected the plans given to him by his superiors. He didn't tell his superiors what were going on. He refused to provide them with information. Eventually, Lincoln said of him, if George McClellan isn't going to use the army, do you think I could borrow it for a while? What was McClellan's problem? Aside from a whole bunch of other things, he didn't tell his boss what was going on. He didn't manage up and he didn't communicate. Now, we have a whole lot of other problems as well, but I think this lesson of, of, of their interaction, Lincoln, Lincoln and McClellan's interaction, is a lesson about what not to do. If your boss doesn't trust you to start with and you don't share information with him or her, it will get worse, not better. Make sure you manage upwards. Lincoln gave the famous, his famous Gettysburg Address on the 19th of November, 1863. It followed a two-hour introduction given by Edward Everett, who was renowned as the greatest orator of his time. And Everett spoke, as I said, for two hours and had in his speech some 13,607 words. In ten sentences, in what is probably the greatest speech in the English language, Lincoln captured not just on that day, but for eternity, what was going on at Gettysburg, what was the demonstration, what happened in the war to them, what those soldiers had achieved and how they would be remembered in very much a bipartisan way at, at a time of incredible conflict in the United States. What's the le lesson from this? It's not about war, it's about communicating. Every job is about communicating. If you're a developer and you can't tell people what you're developing, if you're a project manager and you can't describe your project, if you're a leader and can't give people direction, if you can't communicate, you can't be successful. You really need to build those skills in order to make them worthwhile. What then are the lessons of the Civil War in this um, arena? Resource adequately, plan thoroughly, manage continuously, communicate effectively, and don't forget to lead. I just break one of my important rules, which is don't read the dot points. <laughs> I think it's worthwhile to read and reinforce it. Um, in closing, then, you can't have a good presentation without mini things. Um, are there any questions? Please. Um, you mentioned um, a lot, of, right at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned a lot of the, uh, the 19th century technology. Um, but then didn't mention it again through the rest of the talk. It was really about personalities and about um, the management strategies. So what is your view on how those technologies and the use of them actually affected the outcome of the war? 
Uh, so we could run through any number of them. Um, the use of pick two. two. The use of um, rifled weapons and and bullets with them, better, better bullets, meant that what had occurred uh, up until then, armies approaching to within 100 metres of each other, standing still, shoulder to shoulder, taking it turns effectively to shoot at each other until one broke, stopped. Trench warfare began, it changed, and that's what occurred in World War I, and, and we've seen in later wars as a consequence of that. The battlefield became sparser. I could go on like this for hours. The battlefield became sparser, people spread out, um, it changed the way that we did work. Communications had to change because you couldn't stand behind the soldiers, behind the soldiers with a sword and whack them into place anymore. You had to do different things. So it not only started trench warfare, it started guerrilla warfare as well. So we can have a discussion about that too. Um, the other one that I think is really important is the telegraph and the notion of passing orders and getting information very, very quickly. And we see that. And Lincoln sitting in the telegraph office in Washington conversing with the generals. The next time we saw that happen was in the Gulf War in 1991. Mm -hmm. right? between, that, between those times, communications were broken down between senior officers and you know, the political leadership, but we saw it start again in the Gulf War in 91. I could go on. Uh, a comment on that. Um, telegraph was used during the Civil War for what we would now call facts, the transit facts. Mm -hmm. And remember, the telephone was invented in 1976. Actually, we're going to maps because telegraph is digital. Mm -hmm. They find a way of making them make a point and send those images through. So it, was, it wasn't just the fact that they sent the command through, they could send the maps through. Mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. uh, you, you mentioned one of the risks was failing to adapt. They say we keep going on with the message even though it's not working for that strategy. Um, I mean, in, do you see a case here for a parallel between the sort of agility of being able to? something quickly and lightly um, and the sort of guerrilla warfare maybe rather than sort of over engineering or over provisioning a major yeah so there are there are all sorts of interesting parallels you can win guerrillas can win wars but it takes 50 years it's a bloody long time to deliver an IT project um the, well not that long um the, i think the challenge is to be adaptive as you're saying to be agile but also to have an open mind to possibilities and, and to be, people have to be in control of a project, think about what's going wrong sooner rather than later. I always say you're out of tolerance when you think you're out of tolerance, not when you're actually out of tolerance. I don't want to hear that the project is behind schedule the day you fail to meet a milestone. I want to know the day you think you'll fail to meet the milestone. So you can, you can have a range of possibilities before you and so you can react to them. So when something happens, you think of a new plan and you start to work on that. That's the way we become more agile. But I agree it's a very important point. I'm done. Thanks very much. Yeah.